So I have one friend who said something which is very simple but which I found very interesting. She says that you know when I'm in a one space of being I find I hate everyone and when I get into another space of being I find I love everyone. So I think this is she's very aptly described something we all feel at times right when we are sort of disconnected with ourselves or we just have a mind which is looking to fight we fight the whole world and we hate everyone and everything and when we are in another space where we drop that mind which is looking for a fight we find it easy to connect with everyone and everything so you all find that in you yeah so the point is that it's not the world we need to fight what we need to address is that space inside us which is looking to fight yeah so that brings us to the topic of today's talk i practice to make my heart tender so these are words of karen miller to make peace stop fighting in the struggle between you and your world sign a permanent cease fire in other words she's saying when you find that mind which is looking for a quarrel which is looking to make people wrong become aware of that mind and work to drop it so when the smoke clears you're going to see that your enemy isn't what he appears to be when you're in that particular mind state which is in a mode of wanting to fight wanting to prove yourself right you'll see enemies everywhere but she says sign a permanent ceasefire with life 
and when the smoke clears you will see that your enemy isn't what he appears to be that appearance was largely a coloring of your consciousness of programs in your being so no matter how we react to our environment the environment has no gripe with us the environment has no enemy enmity with us every war is a war with ourselves everything is empty and ephemeral such a beautiful line every war is a war with ourselves so my yoga teacher shared something quite lovely with us the other day he was saying that normally in the hot weather he has a bath with cold water it's his normal way of having bath with cold water but one day he put a lot of this sandal coconut oil which is cooling and then went for a bath and instinctively his hand went to the geyser and he said the environment temperature was what it was but because he had put something on himself he needed warmer water to have a bath with so the environment is what it is but depending on what we coat ourselves with we'll find it hot or cold it's like that so he, she it's saying here um every war is a war with ourselves everything is empty and ephemeral changing we can turn anything into a weapon to wreck, wreck havoc and destroy peace and we do human beings fight 100 year wars if you doubt any of this remember what you took on faith in fourth grade science all matter is composed of atoms atoms are empty space by definition you can't see emptiness you can't even imagine it but you can be it you already are it now to live and let live in emptiness that's the secret to paradise what does she mean to live in emptiness empty of what uh, empty of your judgments but deeper than that empty of your ego see in buddhism shunyata means A very beautiful definition the buddha says all phenomenal of phenomena of mind and matter are empty of a lasting permanent self so i am a phenomena of mind and matter and i'm actually empty of a lasting self because my sense of i is changing thought to thought right but because of continuity i feel like if i take an agarbatti stick it has a golden dot and if i turn it around many times like that it will appear to be a golden circle but it's not a golden circle it's just discrete dots traveling so fast that they have an appearance of continuity but it's not continuous actually so my sense of i is also like that it's changing so fast that i have an illusion that this i is continuous but actually my i is changing thought to thought so what i call i is actually what the buddha said annata there's no permanent lasting self to what i call me and yet i am so aggressive about defending this i protecting this i so that's what karen miller is saying live as emptiness remember that you don't really exist at least not the way you think you exist L- now to live and let live in emptiness that's the secret to paradise it's a secret hidden in plain sight but it can take you forever to crack the code first be quiet give away your ideas self certainty judgments and opinions drop your personal agenda let go of defenses and offenses face your critics they will always outnumber you so beautiful she saying face your critics they will always outnumber you and don't try to defend yourself lose all wars all wars are lost to begin with why are all wars lost to begin with 
when you fight why is a war already lost why are you fighting with yourself make yeah why make says you're not fighting with the outer world you're fighting with yourself why so suppose you're having a fight with hi Arshia you can come here ha. suppose you're having a fight with a friend why Meg would you say you're fighting with yourself because what you think uh, is something that's lacking in them and what you think is um, actually missing in them is actually lacking in yourself can you give me an example? I mean, it boils down to the whole thing where you spoke about uh, whether there difficult people in your life and to get angry because of their pattern. And at the end of the day, that's the pattern of your own subconscious. Right. 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 So, actually. You, you think you're fighting with somebody else but every battle is a battle with yourself because what's inside you is coming to the forefront and you're reacting you just said it's not the empty the empty you're saying that loudly you're, Nash you're saying that you're empty it's only when you're filled up can you fight hmm. if you're empty of the other person and of your own presumption of the other person you can't Exactly. When you say I fight, there is a filled in of I, that I is filled up to fight. Right, right, right. Yeah? yeah? Share Loudly, fight, huh? That's appropriate. A little loud, sweetheart. Uh, so that I don't have to repeat. Yeah. So I remember I was on my morning walk um, a few days back and there was a quarrel between these two men. So it started as a conversation, but it elevated to like a huge fight. And before one of the men left, he happened to, in Hindi, he aggressively came out of Pyar Se Baat Kar. And it was, he was, he wanted love, but to even say that, he said it with so much of anger. Ha. So he was asking for love, but there was no love in his own voice. Yeah. So Good, very, very nice very observation. Where you're asking for love, but you don't have it in you. Anger. Yeah, yeah. So, Karen Miller says that every war is lost to begin with. Abandon your authority and entitlements. Release your self-image, status, power, whatever you think gives you clout. You very often fight to hold on to your status of power, I'm right, ego trips, whatever. It doesn't, not really, that's a lie you've never believed. What's a lie you've never believed? That making that person wrong is going to give you power. It's your clout, it's your right, it's your authority. Your surface mind believes that. But deep down that's a lie you've never believed. Give up your seat. Give up your stance of I am right and you have to see that. Be what you are, unguarded, unprepared and surrounded on all sides. Alone, you are a victim of no one and nothing. You are as ready as you'll ever be. You were born ready. The possibilities are endless. Reject nothing. What appears in front of you is your liberation. That is unless you judge it. Then you imprison yourself again. She further says, Oh, Amy, I know where to go for a kick of adrenaline. I click over to social media site where I'll find a new skirmish gathering speed, inciting the community's opinion. Come here, Amy. Inciting the community's opinion, anger and rebuke. I understand why we do that. I too can be self-righteous, but I am battle fatigued. Which one of us isn't battle fatigued? We are all tired of fighting, no? So she's saying you just have to go to a media site and you'll find something that will make you feel, okay, this is wrong, government is wrong, this is wrong. So she's saying I too can be self-righteous, but I'm battle fatigued. The world cries for compassion. 
it craves acceptance and belonging like Hina was saying, that person was fighting and being aggressive, but really he was only longing to belong. It needs our attention, a kind word, a smile, a wave, a handshake or a hug. Are we against everything, angry at everyone? She's speaking for all of us. We all fall into that space, right? Sometimes when are we against everything, angry at everyone? Sometimes it seems the only thing we'll speak up for is a fight. Isn't it true? It is like that for us. Someone once asked Mezumi Roshi why he practiced. The reply was the title of our talk, to make my heart tender. Whatever I've done in my practice, if it hasn't made my heart softer, Somewhere I haven't done the practice correctly. So this is a story which I share with school children. But I think adults need it just as much. It's called The Perfect Stranger. I live in New York City. And I'm the kind of person who doesn't like to make too much contact with people on the street. Maybe it's a form of neurotic protection. Maybe it's a little reasonable. One day, crazy with deadlines, I was rushing to pack for an overseas trip, make a doctor's appointment and get my taxes to my accountant on time. With eight minutes to get to FedEx, I hurried out of the coffee shop where I'd eaten. Halfway down the block, I realized I was going in the wrong direction and turned round abruptly. At which point, a pedestrian right behind ran into me. To my mind, it was so slight a bump, it could have gone unnoticed. But this other man who ran into me started yelling, How can you be so stupid? You haven't been aware since the moment you left that coffee shop. You can't just go bumping into people left and right. His tone was really derisive. For some reason, he had been nipping at my heels for more than a block. I was outraged. My knee-jerk reaction was to say, you so-and-so, it's a free sidewalk. If you hadn't been walking so close to me, this would never have happened. In fact, I did say a little of that without the cursing, which of course only got him madder. He let out a new torrent of invectives, abuses. And as I watched him become apoplectic, something happened. All the teachings I had been studying about compassion came back to me. And it was as if something in me shifted. In that moment, I genuinely felt this man was suffering as much, if not more than me. I didn't want his day or mine ruined. So I yelled out, excuse me hoping to say something nice. But he just kept walking away, yelling over his back, don't even try, and kept walking. At which point, I did something I could never have imagined myself doing. I ran to catch up with him, put my hand very gently but firmly on his arm, and waited until we had made complete eye contact. Then I said very, very slowly with utter genuineness, I'm sorry, I'm really sorry. He was speechless. I don't think he had ever received a response to anger like that. And I had never been so intimate with a stranger. And I had never been so intimate with a stranger. Time stopped for both of us for a split second. I think both of us saw the other as a real person. Then he sput sputtered, well, uh, well, yes, I guess you had a lot on your mind. Then he whipped around and walked away fast. He was also breaking a mold of his being. So it was awkward for him also. I watched his figure receding in the wash of the street lamp and my heart filled with what? Dare I say love? At the very least, a deep, gratefulness. Here was a perfect stranger pointing out the chaos of my mind, showing me how even a moment of mindlessness can cause suffering. 
and then inspiring me to make a leap over years of self-imposed limitations. New York. And that's a story by Pamela Bloom. So it's a simple story, but for her it was a stranger on the road. But all of us will find these things happening to us in different ways, right? Suppose it could be a family member, it could be a friend who rubs us off the wrong way. And our knee-jerk reaction is to point out to the person, look, you're wrong. You're blaming me, but look, you're wrong. And Pamela Bloom could have gotten into that because in her world, she was right. In his world, he was right. We've said this a million times, right? There are as many universes as there are minds. Each mind is living in its own universe. And what's a truth in my universe may not be a truth in your universe. And we can argue ourselves to death, but you will see truth your way and I will see truth my way. So instead of arguing, it was so beautiful. She was getting pulled into this usual tango we human beings get involved with. But all her, she was a practicing Buddhist. Her years of practice came up and something reminded her. Her practice had indeed made her heart tender. And it came up at the right moment. That's why it's been beautiful said, beautifully said that spiritual wisdom is the only protection you ever have under any and every circumstance. So this, her own wisdom came up and reminded her, hey, what are you doing? You're destroying yourself and you're destroying him. Any moment of this angry exchange is destruction, right? You destroy the person, but you're also destroying yourself. What's the point? And when she dropped her anger, she could see that this was a person who's suffering like me. What are we doing to each other? And that's a moment of tenderness came up and she found the largeness in her heart to apologize. And for her, it definitely changed everything. But even for him, maybe he needed that moment of kindness. We know Pamela Bloom's context, she was rushed, blah, blah, blah. We don't know his context. Maybe he was also going through something very harsh. And he needed that one moment of human kindness to shift something in him. Maybe next time he's angry and he hates people, he'll remember there was one person who was kind to him and maybe his hatred towards people will be less. So that's what Karen Miller is saying, all wars are last to begin with. You can't win a war, but you can win when you drop fighting, when you fight a sign a permanent ceasefire with life. When the smoke clears, you'll see that your enemy isn't what he appeared to be. So Ramana Maharishi, he says, it is false to speak of realization. What is there to realize? The real is as it is always. We are not creating anything new or achieving something which we did not have before. The illustration given in books is this. We dig a well and create a huge pit. The space in the pit or well has not been created by us. We have just removed the earth which was filling the space there. So what Ramana is saying is that this tender heart that we are talking about is like the well which gets filled with water, right? So he's saying that when you dig a well, you remove earth, but you, you can't create space. The space is already there. You're just removing the earth, which is filling the space. So the tender heart is already there. You just have to remove the ignorance and blockages which are there to it. So he says the illustration given in books is this. We dig a well and create a huge pit. The space in the pit or well has not been created by us. We have just removed the earth which was filling the space there. The space was there then and it is also there now. Similarly, we have simply to throw out all the age-long samskaras which are inside us. When all of them have been given up, the self will shine alone. 
and self is already the tender heart. So we don't really have to cultivate a tender heart, we have to remove all the conditioning that takes us away from the tender heart. Toll says, you do not become good by trying to be good, but finding the goodness which is already within you and allowing that goodness to emerge. So beautiful, no? You can't, goodness is not a moral practice. It's not doing good because somebody has told you. But if you remove all the coverings over you, you find you're already good. Remember some Savitri classes back, we'd taken the metaphor of the golden Buddha, that once when the invaders were coming and they were going to plunder the monastery, there was a solid gold Buddha in that monastery and the monks were afraid that the Buddha would fall into wrong hands. So they just covered it up with mud and left it because thinking that if the gold is hidden, less chances of them taking it away. And this happened many years ago, hundreds of years ago. And recently when there was an excavation, the Buddha had of course gone into the earth and when they were excavating, somebody saw a gold gleam and when they pulled out the dirt, they saw the golden Buddha inside. Now that's really a metaphor for us. All of us are this golden Buddha inside. We've been covered up by all our conditioning. And we don't have to do anything in order to be good. We have to just uncover our conditioning and our original face is already good. So a very beautiful definition of meditation is I meditate to see my original face. My original face is the golden Buddha that I already am. Now Sri Aurobindo, the mother's words. In the plane of matter and on the level of ordinary consciousness, you are bound hand and foot, a slave to the mechanism of nature. So she's helping us to understand our conditioning, the earth that covers the golden Buddha that we are. A slave to the mechanism of nature. You are tied to the chain of karma and there in that chain whatever happens is rigorously the consequence of what has been done before. There is an illusion of independent movement but in fact you repeat what all others do. You echo nature's world movements. You revolve helplessly on the crushing wheel of a cosmic machine. So Sri Aurobindo has told us that you think they are your thoughts but thoughts really belong to Prakriti, they are flowing through you and you think they are yours and you think it's your will to think them but really unless you really work to become conscious you have no free will. Every thought is a software program generated as a sum total of all your thoughts in the past. So she's saying, in the plane of matter and on the level of ordinary consciousness, you are bound head and foot. You have no free will. But it need not be so. You can shift your place if you will. Instead of being below, crushed in the machinery or moved like a puppet, you can rise and look from above. And by changing your consciousness, you can even get hold of some handle to move apparently inevitable circumstances and changed fixed conditions. Once you draw yourself up out of the world pool and stand high above, you see you are free, free from all the compulsions. Not only you are no longer a passive instrument, but you become an active agent. When does this happen? When are you free from the compulsions of nature? When you are really able to step back without identifying with thoughts. So it's very interesting one moment when you are identified with that anger or resentment or whatever it's holding you. 
and then the next moment you become aware of something observing this um, so I was talking to somebody and she was having an issue at home and in her mind the issue was very big now I'm not in it I'm a third person as a third person I could see but it's actually a very small issue but when you're in it you can't see that it's a small issue when you're a third person to it you can see that it's being magnified so what I could see as a third person and I also told her look it's very small you're just making it very big in your mind if she had the capacity to step back and witness she wouldn't need me to tell her that she would see that yeah it's actually very small because a third person's view is always a more objective and real view it's like if I'm looking at here from th this height I'll see this much of the earth but the higher I rise the more I'll see the more I'll see the truer perspective and context I'll have right and I can't have that context if I'm totally identified with the thought. I have no choice if I'm identified with the thought. The thought will control me. I'll be a puppet in its hands. But if I can step back, if I can witness that movement, I'll get a more real perspective on it. And that's the space from which wisdom and truth comes. That's when I stop being a puppet in the hands of nature when I can actually be a third person to the movements of my thoughts. And you'll tell me how does that happen well? Really it's a moment of grace that shifts you to awareness, that's true. But you can at least make your attempts of constantly reminding yourself that you are not the thought. And what thought is telling you is not the absolute truth. So I'm not going to be controlled by it. At that personal effort, you remember I shared with you the bluebird story long back, a few Savitri classes back, where the bluebird kept trying to empty the ocean to retrieve its eggs. And then a Mahatma ple pleased with his effort, put his hands into the ocean and got the eggs out for him. Now the bluebird's efforts couldn't have dried up the ocean. But if I keep making my personal effort to remind myself this is not real, my thoughts are not telling me the truth, I am not my thought, that's the bluebird's efforts to empty the ocean. And then there'll be a moment of grace where I'll actually experience this. I won't need somebody to tell me because it's my truth. And the truth will pursue me and find me someday or the other. And I'll see that I'm not the thought. I'm outside it and then I'll get the true perspective on it. Free from all compulsions, not only are you no longer a passive instrument, but you become an active agent. You are not only bound by the consequences of your action, but you can even change the consequences. Once you see the play of forces, once you raise yourself to a plane of consciousness where lie the origin of forces and identify yourself with these dynamic sources, you belong no longer to what is moved but to that which moves. This is precisely the aim of yoga, to get out of the cycle of karma into a divine movement. By yoga, you leave the mechanical round of nature in which you are an ignorant slave, a helpless and miserable tool and rise to another plane where you become a conscious participant and a dynamic agent in the working out of a higher destiny. So beautiful. So what mother is implying is that to come to this witnessing is an imperative step in yoga because that's the time you can start beginning to consciously collaborate with her you can't collaborate if your hands are tied right if you're identified with your prakriti and you can't you're controlled by your thoughts and emotions your hands are tied you can't really consciously collaborate with the divine and the yoga 
but if you can witness if you are free to some extent from the compulsions and pulls of your nature that's when you can consciously click collaborate and create yourself in a new mold and create your life in a new mold at least 9 tenths of our freedom of will is a palpable fiction mother is saying a 9 tenths of our free will is a fiction that will is created and determined not by its own self existent action at a given moment but by our past our heredity our training our environment the whole tremendous complex thing we call karma which is behind us the whole past action of nature on us and the world converging in the individual determining what he is determining what his will shall be at a given moment and determining as far as analysis can see even its action at that moment the ego easily it associates itself with its karma the ego associates itself always with its karma and says i did and i will and i suffer but if it looks at itself and sees how it was made it is obliged to say of man as of the animal nature did this in me nature wills in me and if it qualifies by saying my nature that only means nature as self determined in the individual creature do you understand what mother is saying that when we are in ignorance we will feel i thought i willed i suffer but if we are able to witness we will see that it's nature who did everything in me i did you know we taken up the story of the master linchi some savitri classes back i'll remind you of it linchi was a very enlightened master and when his master died uh he sobbed uncontrollably now linchi was more famous than his master and a whole lot of people had come to pay respects to him and they were shocked to see an enlightened being crying like a baby so one of his disciples whispered to him master please control yourself people are getting very put off seeing this behavior of yourself so linchi said that uh, if people are getting put off let them be put off what do i do i know that life doesn't end and i know that my master's body is not my master and he is still there but my master's body was food for these eyes these eyes are crying because they are starved of the food i have nothing to do with it let the eyes cry if they want to i can't tell them the eyes have no ears i can't explain to them they won't stop crying so he was so aware of the fact that whatever his reactions are part of prakriti the very fact that he could give an answer like this somewhere he wasn't identified with the reaction he was letting prakriti flow through him completely exhaust himself and he would be out of his grief very soon that's how masters are they are they feel out an emotion fully and it's done without leaving a residue in them so that's what mother is saying that if you are a little wise you'll realize that you are not doing anything it's prakriti which is doing everything in you the mind is always in activity but if we do not observe fully what it is doing but allow ourselves to be carried away in the stream of continual thinking the mind is always in activity but we do not observe fully what it is doing because we are identified with it but allow ourselves to be carried away in the stream of continual thinking when we try to concentrate this stream of self moved mechanical thinking becomes prominent to our observation so when we are not concentrated we become the mind but when we concentrate this stream of self moved mechanical thinking becomes prominent to our observation 
it is the first normal obstacle the other is sleep during meditation to the effort of yoga so this continuous compulsive thinking is the first obstacle to meditation the first thing to do is to realize that this thought flow is not yourself such a beautiful and simple priceless line the first thing to realize that this thought flow is not yourself we take it for granted that this stream of thoughts flowing in us is me it is not you who are thinking but thought that is going on in the mind it is prakriti with its thought energy that is raising all this world of thought in you imposing it on the purusha you as the purusha the witness must stand back as a, as the witness observing the action but refusing to identify yourself with it the next thing is to exercise a control and reject the thoughts though sometimes by the very act of detachment the thought habit falls away or diminishes during the meditation it's like this if i'm driving a car i'm holding a steering wheel if my hands are stuck to the steering wheel will i be able to manipulate it properly sometimes i may need to move the hand up or down right but if my hands are stuck to it i'll drive the car very badly only when my hands are free from the steering wheel i'll be able to manipulate it right take the car to be your thoughts you as the purusha are the driver if you are identified with the thoughts it's like your hand is stuck to the steering wheel or worse still stuck to the brake you can't move your leg so only when your hands are free from the instrument that you you are manipulating you'll manipulate the instrument well right if you are stuck to it how can you manipulate you'll get pulled wherever the instrument is going so first thing is to constantly remind yourself that you are not the stream of thoughts going on in your head you are the witness and then you'll see many things about the thought stream once you take that poise once you take that poise your inner wisdom starts speaking to you otherwise when you are identified with the thoughts you're listening to the thoughts so much that somehow you can't hear your own inner wisdom and your own truth so i'll read this again the first thing to do is to realize that this thought flow is not yourself it is not you who are thinking but thought that is going on in the mind it is prakriti with its thought energy that is raising all this world of thought in you imposing it on the purusha you as the purusha must stand back as the witness observing the action but refusing to identify yourself with it the next next thing is to exercise a control and reject the thoughts though sometimes by the very act of detachment the thought habit falls away or diminishes during the meditation and there is a sufficient silence or at any rate a quietude which makes it easy to reject the thoughts that come and fix oneself on the object of meditation now we come to a passage from savitri page 291 the being lived a presence and a power a single person who was himself and all now this being is perhaps the space of the well ramana maharishi was referring to he was saying no that to create a well you can't create space you just dig out the earth and the space which is always there is uncovered and it collects water right 
So this space was already there in the earth even when the earth was in it. That space is like our real self, the God nature, which is there in behind and inside all our conditionings. So he is referring to that space of our God nature. A being lived, a presence and a power. A single person who was himself and all and cherished nature's sweet and dangerous throbs, transfigured into beats divine and pure, one who could love without return for love. In our original nature, we are that which can love without return for love. In our conditioned nature, we constantly need requited love we need i'm doing so much for you you're not doing for me etc but in our original nature the feeling of love is we don't need love because we are love it's like water can't feel thirst right so we are so full of that joy of what we are that we don't need love we are happy to just give it One who could love without return for love, meeting and turning to the best, the worst. So this God nature returns the best to the worst. It showed us itself in Pamela Bloom's reaction, right? The worst was being thrown at her. But that God nature emerged and returned the best to the worst. Meeting and turning to the best, the worst. It healed the bitter cruelties of earth, transforming all experience to delight. When we are coming back to what I started with, that friend of mine who says when she's in a certain mode of being, she hates everyone. And when she's in another mode of being, she finds she loves everyone. So this is what it's saying, transforming all experience to delight when we are connected with that deeper self independent of what other people are we love because it's our nature to love it's not uh, you know there's that beautiful story of uh, a buddhist monk who saw a scorpion on the bank of a river trying very hard to climb and re get out of the water but it kept slipping and falling into the water so the monk reached out and put the scorpion on land and the scorpion stung him. So somebody who saw it said, why did you do that? You know if you're going to touch a scorpion, you're going to get stung. So the monk said, I have no regrets. I did what my nature made me do. The scorpion did what its nature made it do. I can't blame the scorpion. So that's what you have to remember that most human beings are so unconscious that they are total puppets in the hands of their nature. Uh, very often they know being a certain way is wrong, but they can't help it. They are not conscious enough to overcome their nature. So if I know that they themselves are prisoners of their nature, how can I resent them? It's the scorpion's nature to sting. But should I give away my nature and sting back? and adopt the lower nature of the scorpion no it's my nature it was the monk's nature to be a monk so he did what he had to the scorpion did what he had to and nobody is wrong remember there are as many universes as there are minds in the scorpion's universe it's correct to sting it's not wrong in the monk's universe it's correct to stay, save the scorpion and be stung so neither are wrong it's just something see when something hurts us or go wrong goes wrong we are always looking for somebody to blame for our earth for our hurt but it's so good to realize that sometimes it's nobody's fault and we get hurt things go wrong but it's not necessarily anyone's fault it just went the way it had to go deal with it and move on so transforming all experience to delight 
intervening in the sorrowful paths of birth it rocked the cradle of the cosmic child cosmic child is the god potential in us our god nature is always rocking the god potential in us till it flowers and stilled all weeping with its hand of joy it led things evil towards their secret good so the god nature in us is always somehow transforming the not so nice tendencies in us towards its secret good it led things evil towards their secret good it turned rapt falsehood into happy truth its power was to reveal divinity so this god nature in us its whole power is to reveal divinity infinite coeval with the mind of god it bore within it as itself a seed and a flame a seed from which the eternal is new born a flame that cancels death in mortal things i find these lines exceptionally beautiful it bore within itself so this god nature carried in itself a seed a seed is something that gives birth so what does this seed do the seed from which the eternal is new born so all of us have that god seed within us from which the eternal that we are is constantly being new born and a flame that cancels the death in mortal things so we carry in us the seed and this flame the seed from which we are being new born all the time and the flame in us that gives us our right to morta immortality infinite coeval with the mind of god it bore within itself a seed a flame a seed from which the eternal is new born a flame that cancels death in mortal things all grew to all kindred and self and near the intimacy of god was everywhere another very beautiful line the phrase intimacy of god was everywhere intimacy is closeness if so this god nature reminds me that everything is god so that automatically makes my heart tender right to remember that everything is god then i feel close to isha or subhana or rama not because of isha or subhana or rama but because i can sense the god presence in them and i'm constantly feeling intimate to god wherever i am whoever i'm with the intimacy of god was everywhere no veil was felt no brute barrier inert distance could not divide time could not change a fire of passion burned in spirit depths a constant touch of sweetness linked all hearts so this constant touch of sweetness is perhaps what my friend was referring to when she said when i'm in a space of loving i just find myself unconditionally loving everyone a constant touch of sweetness linked all hearts the throb of one adoration single bliss in a rapt ether of undying love and inner happiness abode in all a sense of universal harmonies a measureless secure eternity of truth and beauty and good and joy made one here was the welling core of finite life a formless spirit became the soul of form so i'll just read some of these lines without explanations because that's how savitri is savored the best when it speaks to you directly without explanation a being lived a presence and a power a single person who was himself and all and cherished nature's sweet and dangerous throbs 
transfigured into beats divine and pure one who could love without return for love meeting and turning to the best the worst it healed the bitter cruelties of earth transforming all experience to delight intervening in the sorrowful paths of birth it rocked the cradle of the cosmic child and stilled all weeping with its hand of joy it led things evil towards their secret good it turned racked falsehood into happy truth its power was to reveal divinity infinite coeval with the mind of god it bore within itself a seed a flame a seed from which the eternal is new born a flame that cancels death in mortal things all grew to all kindred and self and near the intimacy of god was everywhere no veil was felt no brute barrier inert distance could not divide time could not change so we'll stop here any questions anything to share anyone somebody said something no okay then let's just sit and assimilate karen miller a zen master her master mejumi roshi when he was asked what is the goal of his practice he smiled and said i practice to make my heart tender such a beautiful goal for a practice what is it to have a tender heart one of my friends beautifully said that when she is in a certain zone of consciousness she is at war with everyone and everything and she finds it easy to dislike everyone and everything when she is in another zone within her she finds it easy to connect and like or love everything so the world is as it is it's we and the state of mind we are in that sees the world as an enemy or sees the world as a comrade an inner vision that helps us to feel connected with the world and see it as a comrade is the tender heart my yoga teacher gave us a beautiful example that normally he has a bath with cold water but when he put a certain cooling oil on his body and he went for a bath he instinctively turned on the geyser and then was struck with the realization that the outer temperature was what it was every day but when he had smeared himself with something that's when the outside fell hotter or cooler whatever thoughts we cover ourselves with we'll think it's the environment which is hot or cold but it's really our consciousness which is creating the illusion of a hot or cold environment an environment which is conducive and friendly or an environment which is hostile and full of animosity and when we are in that zone of animosity we'll constantly attract conflict into our life we saw this beautiful story of karen miller 
where she got into conflict with a man who she bumped into on the road and they were exchanging angry words till suddenly she was a practicing Buddhist. Her practice came to her rescue. She suddenly realized, what am I doing? This man is probably suffering as much as I am. I am destroying both me and my him together. So against the thrust of her nature, she apologized to the man and everything shifted. At that moment, her tender heart came to her rescue. And if we practice to cultivate a tender heart at difficult moments in our life, this tender heart will arise by itself. So beautifully said that under any and every circumstance, spiritual wisdom is the only protection you ever have. If I have spent enough time absorbing this wisdom into my being, when the rubber hits the road, it will arise, delivering me from a heart that's full of poison to a tender heart. Hands together in a Namaste. Long, slow inhalation, breathe out with Om. Um.